Hi, this is Dr. Gopi Manthri Pragada. I'm an interventional cardiologist and vascular specialist at UCLA where I'm an assistant professor. I'd like to discuss PAD or peripheral artery disease. It is a very common disease that I'd like to raise awareness of. So I'm going to discuss treatment options for peripheral artery disease with a specific focus on medical and minimally invasive interventions. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out on Twitter using the hashtag UCLAMDChat or comment on Facebook and I will answer your questions at the end of the talk. So what is peripheral artery disease? This is blood flow compromise in arteries leading to either the arms, kidney, brain, or legs. It affects eight million people in the United States. Keep in mind this is more people than live in Los Angeles, San Diego, and San Jose combined. It is usually caused by cholesterol plaque deposition which narrows the channels through which oxygen and nutrient rich blood flows. These channels are called arteries as opposed to veins which funnel used blood back to the heart and lungs for replenishment. So this is a schematic of all the arteries on the left and veins on the right within the body. Um, so I'm going to get to the screen and describe to you what exactly happens here. So with each heartbeat, the heart pumps out blood approximately one beat every second. Now that blood impulse tra travels through the aorta, which is the main pipe that leaves the heart. It sends blood initially to the heart muscle itself. Then it sends blood to the brain and the arms. Blood then flows downward, supplies the vital organs within our intestines, our stomach, etc. At approximately the level of the belly button, it splits into two. One goes to the right side of the body, one goes to the left side of the body. It travels all the way down to the knee and then divides into three separate arteries, each of which eventually extends to your foot and provides your foot with blood flow. And so obviously this requires uh, energy uh, and that energy supplies by the heart, the pump of the heart itself. Now once your muscles use the blood within the body, that blood is returned to the heart via veins. That's the dark blue schematic here. These veins return through the legs up the, up the abdomen and all the way to the right side of the heart, which, and the right and the left sides of the heart are separated such that the right side of the heart has so-called used blood and the left side of the heart has fresh blood. And that freshness or oxygen is, is supplied by the lungs. So the, the right side of the heart pumps blood to the lungs, the left side of the heart pumps blood to the rest of the body. Each of them does so simultaneously uh, and approximately once every second. So let's move forward here. Um, so this is a, a diagram showing you a normal artery with blood flow flowing freely through the artery. This is a cross section of that artery and notice that it's wide open with smooth blood flow flowing through it. Now this is an artery with cholesterol plaque deposition impacting a certain percentage of that artery. Now in cross section, if you were to look at it here, it almost looks like a, a crescent moon of plaque blocking blood flow going that way. Um, depending on how much plaque you have, it results in a percent stenosis or percent narrowing within this artery. Normally, one doesn't have symptoms unless this narrowing is beyond 70% blocked, okay? Now let's move forward. So moving on to risk factors, why does this happen? Especially for peripheral arterial disease or PAD as I'll call it, the number two risks are smoking and diabetes by far. Unfortunately, have, being a smoker and a diabetic uh, offers you more than twice the risk as either one would alone. In addition, kidney disease, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol are also risk factors for plaque deposition within these arteries. Now, I, I will it add that this mechanism is true no matter where the blockages are, whether it's the heart, the brain, or uh, other arteries as, as we're describing. So what does PAD feel like? It turns out half those with PAD don't feel anything. Uh, in those that do, one can have thigh or calf cramping with physical exercise relieved by rest and that is a typical symptom of what we call PAD. Now why is this? This is because arteries enlarge with physical activity to maximize blood flow to the legs. That's the organ needing the blood supply. If there's a narrowing within the blood artery, that's a fixed blockage. You may feel fine at rest, but will be unable to meet the increasing demands with exercise. Okay, so that results in the cramping or pain with, with exercise. So what other symptoms can one experience? So it turns out that one can have a variety of symptoms associated with PAD. 
You can have leg pain that may or may not go away with exercise. You may have wounds that may not heal or wound, uh, heal very slowly. You can have a decreased temperature of one of, the, uh, one of the legs or one of the feet as opposed to the other one. You may also have poor nail growth or hair growth on that leg that's affected by the PAD. So what's the bottom line? It turns out that if you have diabetes, smoke, or both, and your legs don't feel right, get tested and think about PAD. The test of choice is something called an ankle brachial index, and let me describe this to you. So what we do is we check a blood pressure in the arm, a blood pressure in the leg, and look for the difference between blood pressures. We expect them to be the same because we expect no blockages to exist between the arms and the legs. So a normal ratio of arm blood pressure to leg blood pressure is one. Now if you have decreased blood flow to the legs relative to the arms, we expect this ratio to be less than 0.9. Alternatively, if there's calcium buildup in the leg arteries and they tend to be stiffer than one would expect, that number can actually be higher. So if you have a number higher than 1.4 or a number lower than 0.9, that meets the definition of PAD, of peripheral artery disease. One thing that I will mention is let's say that you have leg pain, leg discomfort, you are a smoker or a diabetic, you get this test done and it's normal. It doesn't mean that we stop there. Uh, one can actually get a test where we exercise you on a treadmill and then check your ankle brachial index at the completion of exercise to make sure that this number does not change. So I'm going to move forward here. Once again, if you have any questions about this talk, please do not hesitate to reach out to, uh, on Twitter via UCLA MD chat or comment on Facebook. So now that you have PAD, now what? So only a small fraction of those with PAD have circulation poor enough that you will require an amputation or a loss of your limb. So that should be reassuring for you, uh, for those of you with PAD, that it's only a minority of you that will, uh, that will have this complication. However, PAD, no matter whether you feel symptoms or not, does increase your risk of heart attack and stroke. And that is of critical importance. Because once PAD is, a, is identified, we will treat you as though you were at high risk for stroke and heart disease uh, with medication interventions and lifestyle interventions. So what interventions are these? The number one overriding intervention is to quit smoking. The second is to achieve better diabetes control. You will need your blood pressure and your cholesterol lowered as well because these add to the risk uh, in those with PAD. So just to mention other medication that, medications that may be of benefit, there's a medication called Celostazole that, that will help improve your walk distance. Um, so this is an, an option if you're trying to uh, delay interventions. Uh, aspirin or Plavix and blood pressure medication will reduce your chances of heart attack, stroke, and even death. So these medications serve an important role in those with PAD. If you have pain at rest for two weeks or longer, Invasive procedures are needed to open up these blockages and, and improve blood flow to the feet. However, it is important to understand that invasive procedures do not prevent progression of disease. That is achieved primarily with medication and lifestyle. So take the first step to recovery, walk. Supervised exercise has been, has been shown to be as effective as relieving blockages through invasive procedures. Now the key here is that it's supervised exercise. An alternative to supervised exercise is a walking program. It's not as good, but it's an acceptable alternative that involves walking at your chosen pace until you experience moderate leg discomfort. At that time, you stop until the pain resolves and resume until you exercise for a total of 50 minutes at least two to three times a week. If you can walk up to eight minutes at a time without stopping, you are then ready to graduate to increased intensity, increased speed. So that's just an example of a walking program, but both supervised exercise or less optimally but acceptably a walking program are two interventions that will certainly help you avoid invasive procedures in the future. So let's say that you've walked and you've taken medication but you still have symptoms that are limiting your quality of life. The next step then is to identify where these blockages are. We do that with ultrasound, CT scan, or MRI that can help evaluate where the blockages are and assist us with planning your treatment strategy. An angiogram, and I'm going to describe this for the, to those of you who don't know what an angiogram is. An angio refers to blood vessel and gram is to look, it's a picture. So an angiogram is a picture of your blood vessel. It involves an insertion of a tube into your artery 
and the injection of contrast dye that we see with the help of x-rays that hover over your uh, uh, that hover over your chest or your uh, the leg that we're imaging and angioplasty is a fixing of the blood vessel this involves the advancement of a wire across the blockage this wire acts as a rail over which a balloon can be advanced the balloon is then inflated at the most narrow section of the artery, squishing the blockage to the size of the artery, and thus re-establishing good blood flow to the, to the rest of the foot. Now here's an example of an angiogram of leg arteries. As I described earlier, this is about where the belly button is, and your, ar your main artery, the aorta, coming down to the, be to the belly button, then splits into both legs, supplying blood flow. This is an example of a perfectly normal angiogram. Notice how smooth and clear the blood flow is without any apparent narrowings or blockages. So the way that we do this is we use a needle to access the artery and using a wire for support we replace the needle with the tube. The tube allows us access to the artery without loss of blood through the tube and it allows us to advance equipment through the tube and fix any blockages that we may find. Now the catheter is generally placed in the groin. This, is, this red arrow, I, I don't know if you can see this here, but there's a tube in this artery here, snaking up all the way here along my finger. And that tube begins at about this level, which is where the groin is. So this allows us to advance a tube through up here, insert contrast dye through the tube, and opacify these arteries and, and allows us to see them but more convenient locations, maybe the wrist or the foot. Now these are options that are not acceptable for everybody, but they certainly are options for some patients. Now these are access points into arteries. All we're doing is going against blood flow and trying to, th trying to find where blockages are. So one can go through the wrist. We do this for heart angiograms. We use the groin also for heart uh, and lower extremity angiograms. Um, this is an example of us getting uh, access in the foot and we do this with the help of an ultrasound. The ultrasound tells us exactly where the artery is and so when we puncture it with the needle we know where we're going. Once we get access we put a tube in just like we do everywhere else and we now have access into the leg artery. So here's an example of a blocked artery at the level of the thigh uh, between the knee and the, and, the, and the groin. Notice this normal angiogram on the, on the right. This is the pre-procedure angiogram on the left. You see the contrast dye coming down here and then it completely stops and that's because there's a blockage here and then you may not appreciate this but there are channels around this blockage that are allowing blood to go around the blockage to the to the artery below the blockage and these channels can be enhanced with walking and that's why we recommend walking as a first step to recovery. So. Why, why would we use the foot? It's because, well, you can recover quicker. Uh, you just have a band-aid on your foot when we're done. Makes it easier for you. There's less, less discomfort overall. It turns out that plaque is harder to cross at the top of the blockage if it's completely blocked because it's subjected to the constant pressure of the heart. When you go from below, from the foot, the plaque is a little bit softer and easier to cross. So, what are the strategies to open blocked arteries? As I described earlier, a balloon dilation or angioplasty is the first step in fixing a blockage. One can also use a technique called atherectomy where we use a, a high speed burr that burrs through these arteries and they come in different types. Some of them spin around the artery, some of them spin on themselves alone. Either way, the strategy is to get through difficult to, di difficult to balloon calcium. Calcium is, you know, Think of them as little boulders in your arteries, that they're, and it's hard to inflate a balloon when there's a, a boulder preventing the dilation of that balloon. So this device helps us get through those boulders, opens up the channel, and allows us to deliver uh, further equipment like a, like a balloon. Stents are metal alloys that act as a scaffold that keeps the artery open. Now, we used to use more stents than we do nowadays. Now our primary strategy is to balloon it and leave it alone and save a stent for a, um, for a situation where we don't have any other options. Finally, uh, over the past few years, we have now uh, had access to a, to a very nice technology. It's a balloon coated with a drug that minimizes the regrowth of tissue within that artery. This has helped us decrease the use of stents significantly uh, and allow, allowed us to treat arteries that we previously didn't have many options for. So, switching gears a little bit from the legs to the kidneys, 
Uh, kidney artery narrowing can actually cause very high blood pressure that is very difficult to treat. Uh, it can also cause, cause a worsening of heart failure symptoms in those with heart failure. Uh, and the reason I demonstrated this, uh, this slide is because, first of all, I want you to appreciate how these two arteries, these are the two arteries that provide blood flow to the kidneys. Notice how right here, there are severe narrowings that are preventing blood to go to the kidneys. Now this can result in kidney, uh, kidney dysfunction, kidney problems, and high blood pressure as I described. Now using the wrist as an access site, we were able to get into the kidney arteries, open them up, open them up with balloons and stents. In, in, in the case of kidneys, we don't use those drug-coated balloons. All we use is stents. Um, and, and as you can see on the right, the results are much better than they were uh, at the beginning of the procedure. So in summary, be aware of the symptoms of peripheral artery disease. Uh, it's important to be aware of the existence of the disease because it certainly has a high burden amongst many of our um, uh, many of our population. Know what puts you at risk. It's primarily smoking and diabetes. Work on prevention by quitting smoking, treating diabetes, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol. Embark on a walking program. No matter what disease condition you have, if possible and if feasible, walking is certainly an, uh, a recommended activity. And medications that will help in addition to walking are cholesterol medication, high blood pressure medication as we described. In addition, psilocizol can help you walk a little bit more, and aspirin. If you remain limited despite all of these interventions, then minimally invasive techniques such as drug-coated balloons may be an option to help you walk longer. Using your wrist and your foot in addition to the traditional groin access allows your specialist to treat your PAD more effectively. Thank you. Uh, Cleve, can you let me know if we have any questions? Thank you. So, one of the questions is how common is peripheral artery disease? And unfortunately, it is quite common. It affects, as I mentioned, 200 people worldwide, 8 million people in the United States, very common in people with diabetes and, and uh, tobacco use. When do I need to take statins? So this is a little bit of a trickier question because statins can be preventative not just for PAD, but also for heart disease and stroke. Discuss this with your cardiologist or your primary care doctor. Uh, there is a... Uh, national guideline provided by the National Institutes of Health that gives us an estimate of your cardiovascular risk based on your age, gender, and cholesterol levels. Uh, using these variables, in addition to high blood pressure, uh, we can give you an estimate of your 10-year risk of having a heart event. If your 10-year risk is greater than 7.5% over the next 10 years, then we recommend statins. What's a good way to quit smoking for PAD? Do I need to consult with a doctor? This is very, very difficult. Smoking, unfortunately, is extremely addictive and very, very difficult to quit. Um, I've had many patients struggle with this, unfortunately, and it's not easy. Um, everybody has their own strategy. I will say the one thing that is common amongst all of my patients who have successfully quit smoking uh, is a motivation to quit. Once you have that motivation, the next steps are, uh, one option is to discuss with your doctor. There are medication options to quit smoking. Uh, the other is I would ad advocate for 1-800-NO-BUTS. It's a, a nationwide hotline, uh, or actually I think a, a statewide hotline, that allows you to call into a number. They act as a support network and give you positive reinforcement on quitting. Um, let me stop there only because it is a complicated issue that I would rather you discuss with your doctor. Any other questions? Okay, well thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, feel free to reach out to us on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, thank you again for your time.